Hello, here's another short story for me, Mikey Campling, which I hope you enjoy. This one is called Deadline. Marty loved trout fishing, so long as he was alone. Always alone. And though the reservoir was within walking distance, it was far enough out of town to feel worlds away from the gum-streaked, grimy streets of the town. Here, among the rustling reeds, he could listen to the gentle waves lapping against the grassy bank, and he could breathe. Marty raises his arm and executes a perfect cast, flicking the fly out across the water and releasing the line so that it unfurls from his fingers and curls through the still air. The fly falls gently onto the surface with barely a ripple. Not bad, he thinks. And as he counts silently, measuring out the time it will take his fly to sink to the correct depth, he isn't aware that his lips are moving. The shape of his line on the water, the feel of it against his fingertips, these are the only things that exist for him now. There are no thoughts of home or work or the errands he should have run. No thought of what time it is. His only deadline is the setting of the sun. But just as the light fades and Marty flicks his eyes towards the horizon, the fishing line tightens for the briefest moment. Marty grips the line and raises his arm to set the hook, but it's too late. The wary fish has not bitten the fly properly, and Marty's line is suddenly slack again. It doesn't matter. The fish is there, and it's hungry. Surely it must be a big fish to be so cautious. A younger, more reckless fish would have grabbed his fly and held on to it for grim death. Marty smiles and fixes his eyes on the place where the fish must be. There you are, he whispers. Gently he draws in a few yards of line and makes another cast. Something beneath the surface swirls the water near his fly and his heart races. He takes a deep breath and exhales slowly. Almost instinctively his fingers work to take up the slack in his line. Wait. He watches the line, taking account of the wind above the water's surface and the currents that run beneath it. This is it. This is one of the moments he lives for. He casts again and again, hunting out the fish. Which way would it have been swimming? Was it cruising the shallows, seeking out the hatching flies, or diving deeper to feed on the nymphs that wriggled below? He can't afford to neglect any possibility. His concentration is complete. As the shadows around him deepen and the air cools, a cloud of tiny black gnats do some hunting of their own and home in on Marty's neck and face. He scarcely notices. And then, suddenly, it is almost dark. Marty curses under his breath and looks from side to side. His shoulders slump. Stupid! He doesn't even have a flashlight. He reels in his line as quickly as he can, and that is when the fish, tormented by the fly, finally decides to eat the damn thing. With one lithe flick of its tail, it attacks, grasping the fly firmly between its jaws. The line slips through Marty's fingers, and for a heartbeat he forgets to raise the rod. He tightens his grip on the line, but just as he'd suspected, the fish is a big one, and it dives hard, pulling the line through his fingers and stripping it from the reel. The fight is long. Each time Marty is sure the fish has tired, it makes another break for freedom, until finally he raises his rod and guides his exhausted prey over the lip of his landing net. Beautiful, he murmurs and as he lifts the fish onto the bank, he's shocked by the creature's sheer weight. He can even see in this poor light that it's a handsome specimen, a fine rainbow trout and certainly the largest he's ever caught. He takes out his priest and holds the weighted end above the fish's head. It's a shame, he thinks. But catch and release is not allowed on this reservoir and rules are rules. He brings the priest down sharply, striking the fish across the top of its head just behind the eyes. Its muscles convulse and shudder for a moment, and then it is still. 
Marty bags the fish, then bends down to the lake's edge to wash the slime from his hands. He gathers his tackle as quickly as he can, scanning the grassy bank in case he's dropped anything. What's the use, he mutters, I can't see a thing. He sets off toward the road, his fishing tackle jangling in his bag as it bumps against his side with every hurried step. Ahead, the stand of pine trees is an even deeper stain against the darkening sky. Marty sets his jaw. The path takes him through the patch of dense woodland. There is no way around it. Never mind, he thinks. My eyes are used to the dark. He strides firmly forward. But as soon as he steps into the deeper shadows among the trees, he stumbles on an unseen tree root. He regains his balance and marches on. Bloody thing, he grumbles. He adjusts his tackle bag, pulling it closer to him. Why does it have to make so much noise? Not that there's anyone else there to hear it, unless... No, he pushes the thought away. He's alone. He's safer here at night than walking the streets back in town. There are no drunks here, no gangs of teenagers with nothing better to do than make a nuisance of themselves. After all, who else would be mad enough to be up here at this stupid hour? But if there was someone out there in the dark, what then? Marty pauses and wipes the sweat from him, from his forehead. He listens. But there isn't even a breeze among the treetops to disturb the silence. He takes a breath. Worrying about nothing, he thinks. But nevertheless, some instinct makes him reach in his pocket for his fishing knife. The smooth handle feels good in his hand. He snaps the blade open. It's a good knife, sharp enough to fillet a fish, and the blade's lock is strong enough to stop it from closing on his fingers. It's not a weapon, he thinks. Not a weapon. But as he sets off again, he holds the knife out in front of him, ready. Just keep walking, he tells himself. Soon he'll be out of this dark wood and he'll meet the road and see the lights of the town in the distance. And then he'll put his knife away. Then he'll be fine. He shakes his head. How could he have been so stupid? How could he have kidded himself that his eyes were used to the dark? No one, he thinks, can see in this pitch-black darkness. But the gamekeeper's eyes are used to the dark. He's been waiting, standing in the shadows beneath the trees for an hour and a half. A gang of poachers have been ransacking the reservoir. He's seen the heavy tyre tracks from a four by four and found the remains of a net snagged on a submerged branch. But he needs more evidence before he can call in the police. He needs to see them with his own eyes. But so far, he's had no luck. He rubs his hand over his face. Another wasted evening. He hasn't seen a single soul. Until now. The man blundering toward him is no poacher. From the look of him, with his outsized bag of gear and his floppy hat, is a typical towny fisherman, perhaps even a regular. But the rules say that all fishing stops at dusk. He should have gone by now. The gamekeeper purses his lips. The poor sap probably hasn't even caught anything. But even so, it wouldn't hurt to check his licence, remind him of the regulations. Give him a fright, he thinks. And as the fisherman passes in front of him, the gamekeeper smiles and silently he steps from the shadows. Hope you enjoyed that little story called Deadline. Uh, plenty more free stories like it on MikeyCampling.com. If you head over there, uh, there'll be audio versions up there for you to uh, download. If you sign up to the newsletter, um, you can play them on the website. If you want to download them for free, you can just sign up uh, and you'll get access via um, a couple of automated a few automated emails just to you know give you links to all the free stuff to make sure everybody gets everything and you also get some free books so worth doing um i don't bother people very often it's not a spammy thing or overly self-promoting it's uh you know just nice to share some things out with everybody and also, you can catch me on uh, Twitter, I'm at Mikey Campling, and I'm on Facebook quite a bit these days. Uh, links there from my website. 
And that story, Deadline, uh, will be part of an upcoming collection called A Dark Assortment. If you go to my website, um, you'll be able to find, I hope, a uh, a link there to get a... Uh, I'll put a link on the, in the show notes, as people call them, uh, to make sure you can get that. Um, because it's not in the menu, it's a special link to get a free advanced copy of the whole book. It's about 28,000 words. There's quite a few short stories in there. Some are very, very short. Some are up to, say, 5,000 words. Some are much shorter. Which, uh, If you enjoy Deadline, you might well enjoy the others. Um, anyway, thank you very much for watching and listening. That's it for me today. So goodbye.